Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha and welcome to Stand the Energy Man on Statehood Day here in Hawaii. It was 60 years ago this month that Stand the Energy Man rolled into Waikiki and made Hawaii home. So this is a special, special week for me. Anyway, we're glad to be here today talking about energy. And a topic that um, actually is kind of mysterious to a lot of folks, and, and I, I convinced Brian Wilbins from Burns and Mac that we should probably spend a little bit of time talking about how you turn heat into air conditioning, because it just seems like a magical sort, sort of system. So we're going to talk about how to do um, basic air conditioning first, and then we'll talk about some more advanced stuff where you actually take heat and turn it into cold. To start off with though, um, Ryan and I do work together uh, on Air Force Project uh, out at Hickam. And uh, I'd like to show a quick video. I'm gonna bring this video in from time to time and uh, get a lot of, of uh, uh, visibility on it because I think it's a, a great intro to renewable energy microgrids, which we firmly believe is the future, especially here in Hawaii. We're already committed to 100% renewable ener energy by 2045 on the grid and also reducing our transportation fossil fuels in, in similar front time frame as the grid. So anyway, if we can roll the video, we'll talk about some microgrids. There are over 300 million people in our country, and the vast majority rely on large-scale, centralized power grids for their energy. But the infrastructure is aging, and it is vulnerable. Natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave large swaths of the country without power. Fortunately, there is an alternative. A renewable energy microgrid represents a different path for the future. Renewable microgrids generate power from sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, waste to energy, and geothermal. That power can be stored within the localized system using technologies such as advanced batteries, hydrogen, flywheels, pumped hydro, and others. These microgrids can provide reliable and efficient energy transmission especially to critical facilities like hospitals, airports, and military bases. Unlike our current large-scale systems, microgrids eliminate single points of failure and are therefore more resilient to disasters, threats, and power outages. Our current energy infrastructure loses a lot of money. Grid outages cost up to $33 billion annually. They are expensive to build, expand, and maintain and they're inefficient, losing more than half of the initial energy to factors such as line loss, spending reserves, and theft. Microgrids solve these issues and greatly reduce transmission loss and maximize efficiency. They also reduce carbon emissions and eliminate imported fuel costs, keeping money within our local economy, and even create new local industries and jobs based on clean, renewable energy. Our energy grid was built over 100 years ago, when energy needs were simple with the increased complexities of energy demands, power sources, and transportation. Now our old grids struggle to keep up. We require new ways to generate, store, and deliver energy. Renewable energy microgrids are a potential long-term solution that will provide safe, clean, reliable, and efficient energy for generations to come. So that's a little glimpse of what Ryan Wobbins and, uh, and his shop and our shop work on. And, and the real takeaway from that is, you know, microgrids are not common, and there's actually quite a few definitions about, about what a microgrid is out there. But what makes what we're doing so valuable and unique is that when you get to a certain penetration level of intermittent renewable, like wind and solar, that's not always there. Clouds come over, wind stops blowing, it turns into nighttime. You need to have energy storage and the balance of batteries to other energy storage in your mix on a, on a renewable microgrid is really a lot trickier than most people think. It's a challenge that really no major utility has conquered yet. So we're trying to do it on a smaller scale and hopefully um, inform the larger uh, utilities some of the possibilities they have to maybe 
sector up their grids and have dispatchable power based on renewable energy microgrids. So Ryan, thanks for being on the show today and and uh, talking about some stuff that uh, I know that I don't truly understand, and that's air conditioning. It's as a fine arts major, it's it's all a mystery to me. I just throw the switch and it goes. But uh, uh, it, it's always intrigued me because I I've heard as I talk to some of the companies that we work with, some of the contractors that oh we have this waste waste heat and we can use it to heat buildings, we can use it to do this, we can use, and we can do air conditioning with it. And I go, really? How do you make air conditioning out of heat? It's just like counterintuitive to me. I, I just don't get it. So I actually thought today what we could do is we could talk about basic air conditioning first, because it's a pretty straightforward concept, but still one that's hard to get your head around because we think of water as a fluid and it boils at 200 something degrees and it freezes at 32 degrees. And we're, we're familiar with that cycle and that doesn't seem to do much for you in the air conditioning cycle. Mm -hmm. But when you change that fluid to a fluid or a, an element that it does boil at a, a much lower temperature and it does turn into a gas at a, at a temperature close to what we have as ambient here, you can actually do some really cool stuff with it. So maybe you can help me explain that. So uh, we've got a, I'll give you a shot to just start talking sure. about it. And then we'll bring up a graphic and, and we'll run through that graphic. Yeah. You can call it up whenever you want to. So we've talked microgrids a number of times and that's that's fun. I can talk about that all day. It's, it's great. I think you're gonna test my Okay. Technical knowledge today. Well, we, we're going to stretch uh, you, I'm certain, by the end of the period, for sure. Electrical engineering to the AC world, but uh, they're, they're related, and that's why that's why we talk about it, too. The microgrids, uh, at, their, at their best, are using all their resources they mm -hmm. can. Uh, when we talk about waste heat, um, even a generator, our, our, our common electrical use, uh, as I'm producing power, I'm, I'm producing heat, and I'm taking it from somewhere else. Um, just as your car engine gets hot, that, right. that's heat wasted by that fuel because it wasn't turning the wheel. It was pumping out heat instead. Something else got hot. That energy right. comes from somewhere. A microgrid, when it's done really well, to become really efficient, will take that heat and use it somewhere else. I think mm -hmm. we've talked about you know maybe maybe using heat in Alaska to, to heat your building, right, and it's right. just not as useful here in Hawaii. Well, that's a real simple transition. You take the heat and push it to some place where you need heat. Exactly. And, and that's pretty straightforward. Yep. So that, that one's easy. That right? one's easy. Now we're a little bit tougher because we're trying to use heat. And I like your name. Was it make heat cool again? Yeah. It's, it's always been rather cool um, yeah, being chemistry. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it, it is possible. Let's, let's scale back and talk about conventional air conditioning mm -hmm. first. Um, and, and the general premise in chemistry that, that all of these are going to stem off of is that when water, or not water, when a liquid transforms, uh, evaporates into a gas, uh, it's taking heat with it. It's, if, you, if you think about a, a water droplet that, that's sitting on, on your skin, uh, maybe after you get out of the water or out of the shower, and then you start to feel cool, what's happening is those droplets of water they're, they're grabbing the heat that's around them and jumping up and becoming gas. When you, when you take that energy, when you absorb that heat and switch to gas, that energy has to come from somewhere. There, there's always an equilibrium amount of energy um, if you, within the universe, mm -hmm. as we've talked before. Well, is first law of thermodynamics, yep. right? Energy is either created or destroyed. It just changes form. Yep. So as you take heat and become a gas, cool is somewhere else, and that's where it came from. So when you get out of the water, the, the skin has all of, or even as you sweat and you start evaporating, you start to feel cool. That is the basic premise of, mm -hmm. of what we're gonna talk about with air conditioning today. Yeah. So it's, it's the same idea, if you can keep rolling back to that, but we're gonna add some additional steps because we don't have, we're gonna start with heat. It's, it's not gonna be uh, quite the same, you can't just throw water on, on a hot pipe and mm -hmm. think that's going to make us cool air. It is, right. It's not quite that simple. So, so suffice it to say that the terms heat and cold are relative. I mean, right now we're at 75 degrees or 72 degrees here in the studio and it's comfortable. 
and and everything feels nice. And but if it was 32 degrees, we'd feel cold, mm -hmm. and and water would be freezing and things. And if it was 110 degrees, we'd be sweating and it'd be hot. But with different chemicals or different elements, there's different boiling points. And you know, like steel is solid at room temperature at this temperature. But you heat it to 2,500 degrees, and now it's maybe liquid and liquefies. And probably if you get it to 8,000 degrees, it vaporizes and turns into a gas. But it takes a lot of energy to get it there. But ice, you set it on the table and it melts. So mm -hmm. the, the idea of temperature is relative. And different chemicals are different, are different elements. We can exploit that by putting them into closed systems and applying pressure or releasing pressure, or applying heat, or applying cold. So is that is that pretty fair? It absolutely is. So we can change the properties of the chemical, or we can change the the pressure around it. So uh, water boiling at 100 is is only true uh, at one atmospheric pressure. Mm -hmm. We go in much higher in the mountain ranges. We'll start to see that that boiling point drop. Drop. Mm -hmm. So. We, we got a lot of variables we get to play with, and we'll go and attack chemistry and use that to our advantage. Oh, one thing we just always will talk about, uh, even on the show today, is that energy doesn't come free. We need to realize that, that as we're creating heat, we're taking cool from somewhere else, um, vice versa. But also there's times where we're inputting energy. Mm -hmm. So I think we could start um, and look at just your window AC unit okay. and talk about that process and how that goes through and where that energy input is. Okay. Because it's, it's not a one-for-one one and we just don't get free cool air from, from hot air. Okay. Well, we'll throw the graphic up now. We'll talk to the graphic a little bit. And, um, and this is basically a simple window air conditioner unit in a, in a real basic closed-loop form. So why don't you talk about those different components and what you're doing and what's happening? So it, you look at this picture and your room where you're sitting would be considered on the left side, mm -hmm. which would be good as that's the cool air. And then that, that the big side of the air conditioner is sitting on the right side uh, where the heat is going That's out. outside the window. Yep. Consider the blue is, actually the whole loop would be the, the chemical that we're playing with here, um, which is a chemical that has a low boiling point. That's, that's the key to how this is going to work without really a bunch of heavy industrial components here. So something like Freon or something you use a refrigerant. Yep, yep. Freon is the best one that we realized right away that is, that is cheap, um, readily available, and uh, has that low boiling point. Um, I've heard, I think the term that I, I had most recently heard of Freon is that it murders the ozone layer. So yeah. that's why we, we've gone to some other uh -huh. different um, coolants. But, it, but it's very good at, at having a very low boiling point. Okay. So what happens is, we let's start with the cool air section right now. Basically, this is just a pipe, uh, a radiator of pipes in your house uh, that we're pushing a low boiling point liquid through, which uh, like the Freon. What that does, is it's absorbing the, the warmer air within your room, and it just starts boiling. It, it evaporates and directly into uh, the gas. It is that low of a temperature. I don't know the actual temperature for Freon, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's considerably low. As it boils or it jumps to gas, which said earlier, it's taking heat with it. And it, behind it, it leaves cool, um, uh, the cooler temperature. Mm. That cool temperature is sitting on the outside of that radiator, on the outside of the pipe. So behind that cool air uh, radiator you have, on, on the right side of it, there'd be a fan. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to blow Pushing the across, cooler. across yeah. the pipes. And that cools the air um, because the pipes are cool. So that, that evaporator at the bottom is basically kind of a, a valve that only lets so much of the liquid through. And there's pressure on the, on the, on the hot side and less pressure on the blue side. Mm -hmm. the, the, and, and it's like when you spray a can of paint or something and the can starts to get cold as the pressure is released the can starts to get colder and colder to your hand yep. because it's pulling, it's pulling heat yep. and it it's, feels cold to your hand. It's, it's got a, a rapid expansion to it as well with the, with the volume. So that's it, exactly the same it's as the air cell can um, is what's happening on the bottom side. Mm -hmm. The reason the pressure was so high on the other side of that evaporator, if we continue uh, to the up to our compressor, at the top here we, we have this boiling Freon, 
Um, it's, it's hot at this point, mm -hmm. um, and we need to, to get back into reusing this. Um, we want to take that heat and get rid of it so we can go reuse that, that Freon on the bottom side of our diagram. The, it's not easy just, just getting rid of heat quickly, so what we do here is we add the compressor and we play with thermodynamics by increasing the pressure very, very fast. We can actually force the, the Freon back down into a liquid form. And um, which is actually rather clever. It, it, it takes some of the heat out by that point, and then we're, we'll shove that back through um, another radiator and blow the coils across that so that heat gets pushed out. We're stripping it off with the fan. And um, we're still at a much higher pressure, but the liquid has now cooled down as, as we push that out uh, into the air. Yeah, because the relative air temperature outside is still cooler than that Freon when it's when it's in the liquid form. Yeah, that's the neat, the neat component yeah. about Freon. That's where that cool. relativity piece came in. Well, we're gonna take a quick break now. We'll be right back with Ryan Wibbins and, and get into the real mysterious part about uh, how this air conditioning system works a little bit more and maybe be even getting into uh, exchanging heat for cool. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Back to Stan the Energy Man here on Admissions Day in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, congratulations to the citizens of Hawaii for, what was it, 1959 we became a state. So that was, that's awesome. We've made it so far. Hopefully we can keep it together for a few more years. At any rate, we're talking air conditioning with Ryan Wobbins from Burns and McDonald. And, and uh, you know, we, we're going to throw that graphic up again for just a few more seconds and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. This is a closed system loop, very much like a window air conditioner. And I want to compare it to some of the experiences we have when we, when we deal with hydrogen, because these same principles, even though we're not dealing with Freon, we're dealing with hydrogen, it's the same principles apply. When I, when I take hydrogen out of my station and pump it into a car under pressure, it heats the car's tank up, just like on the right side of this, this uh, graphic. And when I push the, the um, or pull the, hydrogen out of my storage tanks, it looks like the left side because we're dropping the pressure and it's cooling down. It's, it's pulling heat out and cooling itself down. So this is a universal principle with virtually all elements. Um, it's just different elements have different temperatures at which they boil um, and boil off into gas or turn into a liquid or turn into a solid. So the trick with air conditioning is picking the right kind of fluid or the right element to throw in this loop that keeps that boiling point real close to what we're comfortable with, 70 something degrees maybe uh, Fahrenheit, and run it through this cycle, pressurize it on one side, it gets really hot, but not as hot as, or it's hotter than what we have for ambient temperature, and running it through that um, radiator or heat exchanger on the right cools it back down a little bit, run it through that, that squeezed valve called an evaporator on the bottom, and it, it actually, when the pressure's released off on the left side, it's, it starts to chill out again, and then we blow that cold air into the room and take the a little bit warmer gas now and put it back into the compressor and keep it going through the cycle. So this is a really basic air conditioning system, and it's really uh, pretty easy for even a guy like me to follow. But we're gonna go a step up here, and I don't have a graphic for it. I actually looked for one, but even the graphic was too complicated for me to, to put on the screen where I thought we could explain it, and it was too hard to draw. But it has the same basic principles, um, except that they're, they're more involved. There's, there's more loops than just a single loop. There's actually a couple loops. 
and a couple stages to it. But you can actually use the hot um, uh, bleed air or air that's uh, waste heat from another process like a big engine or something. And you can use that heat to do similar work that the compressor does. In other words, to get that side back into a gas, you can heat it up and, and, um, and get the conversions to go between gas and, and um, liquid again. So Ryan, I'll let you try and take it from there. I, I know that you're an electrical engineer, not a mechanical engineer, but um, you're way smarter than me, so I'll let you lead the discussion here. Yeah, we'll let the, the love of science try and kick in and see what we can okay, get out all right. of it. So um, what we're talking about now is, is, is flipping from adding that compressor um, previously. That compressor was our external energy that we were adding into the system. Electricity we had to put in there, right? Yep, to, to get that, that cooling or that, that compression effect back onto the, um, the, the Freon. Back to the Freon so that we could push it back through and get it back into the liquid form. What we'll use now, instead of using the, that electrical compressor, we're gonna add a, a second stage on. So we're gonna have like two loops of cooling that go on here. And in the end, we will take our hot air, um, hot uh, medium, mm -hmm. and, and, and come back out with like a chilled water or something that we could use for air conditioning. Um, it should be known that th this is a rather old technology, but it's, it's really only effective at, at a much larger scale. You're not going to see see this on a house. Um, I think there are even RVs that, that use this because mm -hmm. some of their, their motor heat is, is so high that they can they can handle this this type of loop. But um, maybe one day the technology will change and we can have something like this used more on Yeah, not to, on not to go too far off track, but I rented an RV once on the mainland or in Alaska and, and made a trip. And the refrigerator ran off of propane. Mm -hmm. I mean, the coolant in the refrigerator was the propane. Mm -hmm. So you could burn the propane on the stove, and they also used the, the, the propane as a refrigerant in that same type of cycle. And it actually was a very cheap way to run the refrigerator. Yep, and, and appliances are sold that way. So your refrigerator, uh, the one we have here, uh, the one that you, you saw in Alaska, this is the same idea of what's in your window unit. Mm -hmm. It's just we put in a box and we turn the temperature down even more. Right. Insulate it better than we insulated our, our single wall houses mm -hmm. here. So an absorption, absorption chiller, the idea is we have a, a hot product and we're gonna use a, a medium, um, most commonly used a, a lithium bromide. Um, I think that's essentially salt water in a way. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is we'll take this uh, lithium bromide and, and we're gonna run it into our hot water. The lithium bromide at this time is considered a, a weak solution. So it's got a lot of water in it too. As we run it through that um, getting very hot, what will happen is that the lithium bromide will split off because the water is going to evaporate. Because we're, we're dealing with really hot, um, at this point, uh, high pressure. Six or 700 degree temperatures yep. and stuff. So we're, we're driving out the water and we're gonna set it onto a, another side of our tank. We're gonna drive down this this, um, at this point, strong lithium bromide solution, and we're all at a, at a very high pressure. We'll send the lithium bromide off, and we'll, we'll take the water on the other side as it, it's already evaporated, and we're gonna try and cool it to where we can start using that, really that hot, that steamy air. Um, I'm gonna take a peek at a, another diagram here okay. to try and, try and cheat a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, so this, this, this water, this hot water is, is dealt with on this high pressure side. We had a cool water loop tank that we're here that we're gonna have to talk about in a little bit, but that, that was allowing us to condense the water back to where we could use it and run it back through mm -hmm. um, our low pressure system loop. What happened with the sodium bromide now is let's follow that back down a little bit and we're taking that um, through a heat exchanger. That's gonna drop its temperature a little bit and push that through a low pressure tank. Now that we change the pressure, that's going to expand and cool, cool. as well. Okay. So we're cooling on that side, which created the cool water that we used up above, mm -hmm. um, that I said we, we we're just gonna kind of magically appear with. But what's happening in this low pressure tank now is we are creating a cooling effect on this bottom side because we had that, that, expansion. that expansion mm -hmm. yep, on, the, on the low pressure side. On the other side of the tank, we're, we are doing the same thing where we are um, pushing water back down over our, what, which will then be our cool side, and having it's that a separate loop? It's, the, it's a separate loop, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So now this water side, um, which was the condensing and evaporative side, is very similar to what we were showing before. That's where you're, you're going to expand. And you're, instead of blowing air across it, the, these are typically coils that um, you're spraying uh, water. Showering water, like yeah. a chiller unit. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this, this low pressure tank is, is really actually very cool in temperature. And the sodium bromide is doing something real cool where it's taking on a lot of it's taking on water very fast because it likes to take on water. It doesn't like to sit uh, in its in its um, what do I say the heavy concentrated form, concentrated state, form yeah. very much. So it's going to accelerate the water um, being pulled into it, which helps move uh, everything through the system. So it's I probably butchered that in a few <laughs> ways, but we're playing with thermodynamics um, in two different stages. Mm -hmm. We're playing with pressures. Um, in addition to the temperatures, mm -hmm. and we're forcing one to to separate another, mm -hmm. and in that form, um, we can essentially do what we did on the other format, but we weren't using um, an actual compressor. Mm -hmm. That time we we're using the. Okay, heat. so let me ask you some questions, and maybe that'll help everybody kind of see it. These are two separate loops. They don't they don't cross over, but they go through a common area where there's heat exchanged in that process, right? Mm -hmm. So you have two separate loops going through this. And on the one side, you've got the bromide, lithium bromide solution. But on the other side, you have a, a different element running through that loop, right? So you're, you're kind of using um, two boiling point, two different kind of boiling points to, to get that real hot lithium side cooled to a level. And then another system that takes it the next step and takes it for more of an ambient temperature into the refrigeration piece. Is that a fairly there, good comparison? There are two separate loops going like this, but when we get them back to the tanks, they, they, they intermix, and that's where the magic is happening. When we're on our upper high pressure tank, um, we're, we're bringing in and pouring across a, um, a, a low concentrated lithium bromide with water. So we are mixed on this loop that's coming in on the, on the other side. As we get it hot, that's where we, we separate out into to, to two different loops again, because mm -hmm. we're on one side of the tank, it's just a barrier sitting in the middle of the tank, and we're gonna let the hot water go to the one side, and we're gonna let the, the, the lithium, lithium bromide, bromide just fall down. That, that's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, we're not, not sitting in there separating by any mechanical okay. device. And then they're gonna split back out, and, and we'll use them, <laughs> we're crossing every which way. Um, because I want to get my water back onto the other side of the, the low pressure tank, and, and we're doing the same thing down here on the, the low pressure side. Okay. So we had hot, and we did some magic, and we bring it down here, and we, we flip the, the pressure um, and the temperature again mm -hmm. on the low pressure side, and we drive out cold air or cold water typically. Okay. Well, I hope that's really clear to everybody. It's still a little bit of a mystery to me, but I think I understand a little bit better. And if nothing else, we're going to encourage a bunch of folks to go be chemical engineers and, and really learn about how to do this stuff. And we'll get some mechanical engineers. And maybe, maybe you can bring one of your mechanical engineers next time, and we'll, I need we'll to bug run one them of through the, gear, the grill. And we could go through a system. A neat place to, uh, to do this is in a cogen unit where you, you, you use a fuel, um, whether it's natural gas or something, to generate a lot of steam. I'm going to drive that steam mm -hmm. through a turbine that generates electricity. Yeah. That's where I start to have fun. I'm going to give the steam to somebody else. It's just got cooler. And they're going to use it for boiling um, products or water. Maybe right. you're a factory that needs to boil some stuff. But I still got this leftover heat. Now I can drive that through you in maybe a slower speed turbine and get some more energy yeah. out of it. And then go back through my, I still got enough heat at the bottom yeah. at the end of the day to run through an absorption chiller. So I just got electrical power, I got heat, I got maybe a little bit more electrical power and cooling yeah. all out of one system. That's awesome. So that's key, kind of the key to the whole reason we're talking about this is it goes back to sustainability. Taking that energy, which is a finite, just changes form kind of a commodity, and use it as best we can, the best way, in the best form we can, whether it's electricity or heat or cold or steam for uh, expansion, generation, compression. So the same principle that you see in air conditioning and these um, absorption chiller units is really actually similar to steam engines and Rankine cycle and, and the other temperature thermal kind of engines that give you mechanical power out of different pressures and different temperatures and boiling point of different chemicals. It's really fascinating. I wish I was back in high school again and could start my chemistry uh, career all over and learn this a lot better. But uh, 
I hope you find it interesting. We'll try and uh, do some more clarification later. But until next Friday, I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks for being with Robert and Cindy here in the studio. And thanks to Ryan Wilbins from uh, Birds and Mac for helping us out. Until next week, aloha. See you next week.